Something that I ask a lot, and I, th I wonder if you do, is how can I see God bring more transformation in my life and in other people's lives? You know, psychologists now think that 95% of what you do in a day is subconscious. 95% of what you do in a day is subconscious. 5% you consciously choose to do. So just to give you an example of this, I just want you to fold your arms in front of you. Some of you have already got them. Just fold your arms. Now fold them the other way. Oh, can you do that? Can you do that? You can fold them the other way. I can't. I, feels weird. Does that feel weird to you to fold it the other way? It's just kind of... Have you ever tried to change what you eat? You tried to change what you eat? Right, every couple of months, it'd be like, right, I'm cutting out sugar. And then uh, it lasts about half a day. It's, uh, it's kind of this subconscious stuff that, that goes into our life. And, and so often when we're seeking transformation, we find maybe 5% of our life can change. But the 95% remains untouched. And it's like, well, it frustrates us. It frustrates me. Maybe it frustrates you. I don't know. Uh, and so what we tend to do is we sort of think, right, this is what we, we kind of, we, we diagnose the solution to this problem. And uh, maybe we think, oh, I need to, uh, you know, I, I need to read more of my Bible. There's nothing wrong with reading more of our Bible, let me say that. I think, oh, I just need to pray more fervently with more faith. Maybe that will bring transformation. Again, listen, there's nothing wrong with that. We, I, I want to pray more, fervently with more faith. We want to have, some people will often say, I want deeper teaching. I want deeper teaching, that's going to be the answer. And often by deeper teaching, we mean facts. You know, I didn't, oh, I didn't know that Hebrews was maybe written by this person, the book of Hebrews. I didn't know this was maybe written in this date. Listen, there's nothing wrong with all of those things. But Paul, the apostle's diagnosis for how we see transformation is something that sits below those things and through those things. Those are tools which are used ultimately by the Holy Spirit. And Paul's diagnosis for the churches that he planted and led and wrote to was this. He says it in different ways, in different places. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, which I hope will come up here for you. He says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And it's very likely here that Paul's quoting a prayer which was just a, a standard prayer that was prayed in many churches. They think, they think Paul probably didn't make this up himself. He's quoting like a hymn, like a, a standard blessing, a prayer of blessing that was, was said all across the churches in the Mediterranean just in those early days of the church. Whether that's right or not, I'm not sure. But what it shows us is this. In Paul's mind, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is the thing that can change this 95% of subconscious action within us. True transformation comes not by us necessarily doing something different or increasing something and doing something slightly less. Those things can help. But true transformation comes when we find fellowship with the Holy Spirit, love of God, and the grace of Jesus. In Hebrew... This word Holy Spirit, in, in the very kind of early chapters of the Bible, the, the word is, is ruach. Can you say that to me? Ruach. Ruach. I like it. It's going to ruach. And it feels more to it than Holy Spirit, which I think now, I don't know about you, I've just heard Holy Spirit so many times it doesn't grab me as a name, but ruach. And when we were in Africa, I believe, tell me if I'm correct, is it in Swahili? It's Rom Takatifu. Rom Takatifu. And every time they said the word, you'd, you'd preach or speak and you'd say the Holy Spirit and then they'd translate. And it doesn't matter in what 
manner you said the word Holy Spirit, every time they say, Ram Kakatifu. I loved it. I loved it because it brings a focus on this presence of God, this third person of the Trinity. Ruach. Ruach. And I want to, uh, I want to try and lead us in the coming weeks into an increased obsession with Rom Takatifu, with Ruach, with the Holy Spirit, with the Paraclete, with the third person of the Trinity. Because in Him and in fellowship with Him, we can see the transformation that I long for in my life and I'm hoping you long for in your life. I want to say this to you. This was a bit of a revelation to me. That the Spirit of God brings the love of God and the grace of God to people. Let's work through. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 1, the beginning. It's always good. Whenever you're trying to work out what the Bible says about something, it's always good to start at the beginning of the Bible. You know, if you start at the end and read backwards, you can kind of bring your own ideas and concepts in. If you start at the beginning of the Bible and read forwards, it's much more likely the Bible's going to redefine your own understanding. You won't impose so much your own thinking on verses and passages. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, which I, I don't know is going to come up, maybe, we see the Spirit of God, the first use of this word ruach comes. The Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. And there's a sense that, there's a tra- that, that the word that theologians use is transcendent. God is transcendent, which means he's everywhere, all the time, over everything. And the, the, the word used there, hovering over the waters, is, is, is showing the transcendent nature of the Spirit. Just over everything, watching over everything. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God breathes, ruach. God's breath, ruach, the soul of lives is the Hebrew, the soul of lives, like life. He breathes life into the dust, into the nostrils of Adam. And what I love about this, it's the transcendent God who's everywhere in every way all the time, now being kind of brought down and concentrated into a specific action of God into the nostrils of a person. And so the transcendent becomes, in theological language, imminent. Imminent. This transcendent God who's everywhere suddenly becomes really concentrated and focused and breathed into Adam. And Adam takes on some of this breath, some of the ruach, And it lives in him. Think about it like this. Have you ever taken a child to a playground, you know, like an outdoor playground? And and kind of, you know, when it's the first few times, you sit maybe on the edge and you watch them. And you're like, oh, they're, you know, they're climbing up that climbing frame. And you're kind of, you're watching. Everywhere they go, you're transcendent in the playground. And then there'll be a moment where that you kind of you approach the child and you embrace the child and you love the child. And that's when you're becoming imminent for the child. You were transcendent, you were there, you were watching, you were present, but then you approach and you become imminent. And the Ruach of God is, the, is where he takes his transcendent presence and makes his transcendent presence imminent in this moment. It's like this. It's like this. Here we are. I've got this as a little. In this room, there's air. There's air in this room. Air is transcendent in this room. But here you see, we have the ability for the air to become imminent. It's a bit hot, make it cold. The air becomes imminent for me, for Michael. You haven't got a wig on, Tony, have you? That would be be embarrassing, wouldn't it? Look, it becomes, oh, yes. Becomes imminent. And God's loving presence is everywhere by his spirit. But by his spirit, what he wants to do to you is blow 
His love and make His love imminent, His presence imminent in your life, in your heart. This is my own personal one. My morning friend. That's what we see in Genesis 1. So God, um, Paul the Apostle says, in God we live and breathe and have our being. The psalmist says this, the glory of God fills the earth. Phil mentioned it this morning in the Psalm 139. He says, where could I go from your spirit? You're everywhere. Yes, God is transcendent. But we don't want to relate to God as just a transcendent God. And God does not want to relate to you just as the transcendent God who is everywhere. God wants to become imminent. He wants to breathe in your nostrils. He wants to bring his love, not just as his concept, this out there thing, but actually come and breathe life in an imminent expression. The rock comes to you. Ezekiel chapter 37 I love this. I love this. Ezekiel, he was a maniac, wasn't he? I mean, the guy was insane. He was insane. Which gives great confidence to those among us, mentioning no names, who were a little bit insane. It gives you confidence, doesn't it, Michael? Doesn't it? <laughs> You think, oh, the Lord, he can use people like me. Even with those shirts. I mean, he can bring. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel is carried away by the ruach of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. The transcendent spirit is there seeing this valley of bones. He's present in this valley of bones. And and God shows to Ezekiel that this valley of bones represents God's people. God's people. The valley of bones represents God's people. And, and, And what I love in Ezekiel is it shows that when God's people are dead in their faith, he sees them. He sees you. When you're struggling with your faith, when you're overwhelmed and you feel like you're running from God, when you know that the sin is overwhelming you and you know if you really looked at your heart, you wouldn't be a representative of Jesus you'd want to be. You know as God's people, this is before Jesus has come, but Israel, they've given themselves to idols. They've rejected all the words of God and yet God's Spirit sees them. He's present there in that valley. And maybe you're sat here this morning and maybe in your life right now you feel like a dry bone in a valley. Well, the Spirit of God sees you there. And actually in the language in chapter 36, there's a specific deliberate point, deliberate point back to Eden. It actually mentions the Garden of Eden in in chapter 36 of Ezekiel. So you have in your mind... Is this going to be like Eden, where the transcendent spirit is present in a place where there's chaos and disorder and nothingness, just like there was at the beginning? Is it that Israel and humanity is in some way rescinded and rebelled so greatly that they've taken the order of creation and they've almost taken it back to the chaos and the nothing that there was before time? Is it that God is going to do a new creation somehow, some way by his spirit? And the Spirit asks Ezekiel this question. And Ezekiel does something very clever. He says, you know the answer to that, God. And this, chapter 37, verses 9 and 14, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, come, O ruach from the four winds, and breathe, ruach, in these dead bodies so they may live again. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will put my spirit, my ruach in you and you will live again and return home to your own land. What God does, the transcendent God, he sees your life, he sees the things in your life, he's present. And if you're a Christian here, he's in you. He's present in your life. 
If you're not a Christian yet, in God you live and breathe and have your being. God sees you, he's there with you, but God's desire is not just to be with you, not just to be in you. He wants to ruach, breathe, breathe, make imminent his life-giving love and presence that would give you life that you may live again. The transcendent spirit becomes imminent in a loving, life-giving way. And the, the transcendent presence of God is not just, oh, God's here. No, it's a dynamic force. It's the love constantly being blown over you and in you. His presence is a dynamic force. He wants to love you. The love of God, the grace of Jesus are dynamic forces at work in you. That's God's desire. He wants to bring life to dead bones. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit is what God's desire is for your life. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit with this dynamic, life-giving presence of God himself. Not just out there, but imminent, concentrated down and bringing the love of God into your whole being that you may live. Paul in Romans chapter 5 talks about like a whole new way of being human. Not like Adam, but like Jesus. The Jesus way of living. Well, what's fellowship? Fellowship of the Holy Spirit. If we're saying that fellowship of the Holy Spirit, this is the desire of the early church for all and every one of their people, we need to know what fellowship means. The word for fellowship is a word that brings a sense of participation. It's often used about the church. People with one another, partner with one another, join with one another, love one another. It's often used, most often used, as a word with one person with another. But, but in this moment and in several other moments, it's used between person and God. That you would have fellowship with God almost in the same way that you could have fellowship with your closest friend. Such a human, bringing God of himself down to breathe and be present in your life. Participation in the love of the Father. Participation in the grace of Jesus. Participation with the Spirit. I want to tell you, God's love can be known. And actually, God's greatest desire is that you would know his love. Not in your mind, but you would feel his love by fellowship with the Spirit, by participation. And so fellowship, it's not enforcement. The fellowship of the Spirit doesn't force things on you. It's not a formula. You know, if you want to see transformation, I've done this, maybe you've done this. You kind of want to find a book that tells you how you do it. I want a formula. You know, what prayer do I need to pray? What things do I need to do? What time of day? And how does it all fit together? It's not a formula. It's friendship with Father, Son, and Spirit. It's the breath of God. Participation in what He's breathing, His loving goodness. Let's just do a little case study on the, if, you're, if you don't mind. On, uh, if you do mind, tough luck. On the Gospel of John. See, at the beginning, John doesn't use the word ruach, mainly because he doesn't write in Hebrew, but also he deliberately uses the word logos, which we translate as word, because of the people he's writing to and the kind of concepts they have. And, and it says the word becomes flesh. And comes into the world. So Jesus is like this, this kind of this walking hairdryer. It's like this walking hairdryer of the loving goodness, the grace, 
the reality, the truth of God. And it says in, in the, what's called the prologue, the first chapter of John, that he came into the world he created, but the world did not recognize him. This transcendent God concentrates him da- himself down, and yet people don't recognize it. They don't recognize it's God himself who's, tra- who's kind of concentrated himself down. But to all who do recognize, who do believe and accept him, he gave the right to become children of God. They're reborn. Ah, takes you back to Ezekiel, takes you back to the Garden of Eden. It's like a whole new beginning, a whole new creation of humanity. They're reborn. I love this. Not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. You see, the Spirit is concentrated down, becomes imminent to such an extent it's like it takes you back to the Garden of Eden and it's like breathing in your nostrils again, a whole new creation of humanity. And so we see throughout the Gospel of John all kinds of this stuff happening where Jesus, the walking hairdryer, is not recognized and people are like, well, don't blow that in my face. You know, that's not what I want in my face. But some are like, wow, this is, uh, this is God himself. It's not quite what I expected, but I can tell. This is the loving kindness. This is the grace of God. And Peter, at the end of, at the, end of the Gospel of John, sees, finally, that this is... This is about God. This is God coming. And and, and Thomas, the other disciples were with Peter at that time, but Thomas is like, he he kind of summarizes the whole point of the gospel. The whole point of what John's trying to say is summarized by, by Thomas because after Jesus has died and risen from the dead and he shows himself, and Thomas is like, I want to see this. I want to see this is real. And when he sees, he doesn't even need to put his fingers in Jesus' hands to prove that Jesus has died, but he sees that the only explanation here for for the resurrection of Jesus is that he is the manifestation of new creation. He is the Ruach of God personified. He is the walking spirit. He's the one who's overflowing, who's been filled with the spirit beyond limit. And Thomas says this, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. And... uh, It's like just this beautiful, wonderful moment where Thomas, in doubt, like dry bones, has the Spirit of God breathed on him by the manifestation of the Spirit. Jesus himself is breathed on him, and he's like, wow, I see now. Life comes to Thomas. And Peter, I love it, because Peter and the disciples, they're told by Jesus, you know, in John chapter 20, like, I'm going to breathe on you. And he breathes his spirit on them. He's risen from the dead and now he breathes. And it's like this, this kind of manner, he kind of imparts the Ruach of God to the people, to the disciples. And then Peter, reflecting on it several years later, says this, by his divine power, this is 2 Peter chapter 1, God has given us everything we need for a living a life of God. We've received all of this by coming to know him, the one who has called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So Peter reflects on this. And he realizes that when Jesus breathed, he imparted the Ruach into him. It enables Peter and all others to have received all they need to live a life for God. And in fact, in an amazing way, almost draws them into the Trinity. That they can share in the loving relationship of the Trinity. So fellowship of the Spirit is true participation with God. Participation with God. 
openness to the Spirit. Does that come through? See, the Spirit is God's breath. It's His ruach to enable you to experience and know life. All you need for life. All you need for life. And draws you into the intimate, divine nature. Like they're kind of the, the ongoing relationship of the Trinity. You get drawn into that. I wonder if you're sat here and you're thinking, I wish I could move beyond striving. I just wish in my life, I just didn't need to feel like if I can just get this job, I'll feel good about myself. If I could just see this person like me, I'll feel good about myself. If I can just achieve X, Y, or Z, I'll feel good about myself. If you want to move beyond striving, the fellowship of the Spirit is the way. Do you want to be really secure that when you look in the mirror, you maybe don't even like physically what you see and yet there's just a deep security. I'm not phased. I'm a bit ugly, but I don't care. I, I, I don't feel, I'm secure. I'm totally secure. I'm totally secure. I just know I'm loved. Do you want that in your life? Do you know I saw a statistic, did you see this, that 20% now of teenage girls, I think between the age of 11 and 15, 20% self-harm. I think, was that correct? 20%. Because they're so insecure in themselves, they're not loved, nobody's telling them they're Do you want to move beyond that? The fellowship of the Spirit is the way. Do you want to become a person of true love and kindness? Do you want to be able to treat somebody even when they mistreat you? Do you want to be able to turn the other cheek? Do you want to be able to love your enemy? Do you want to be able to bless those who persecute you? Do you want to be a person who truly embodies grace and kindness? The fellowship of the Spirit is the way. Do you want to see real transformation in your character? Do you want to see yourself moving beyond addictions and habits that are destructive and you know they're destructive? The fellowship of the Spirit is the way. Do you want to move beyond all loneliness? Do you just want to move beyond loneliness? The fellowship of the Spirit is the way. Do you want to be healed of wounds from the past? Do you want to be healed from the wounds that maybe your, maybe your father wasn't present in your life? Maybe he was never present in your life. Or if he was, maybe he was abusive. Maybe he was aggressive. Maybe your mother didn't really care for you. Do you want to be healed of those wounds? The fellowship of the Spirit is the way. Do you want to be able to use your power well? Are you conscious that God has given you influence and authority? Maybe in the home, maybe in the workplace, maybe in the community. You can tell that when people, when you speak, people hear, listen to you. Do you want to use that well? Do you want to be able to use power well? To do good and not to do evil. The fellowship of the Spirit is the way. Do you want to be like Jesus? So much want to be like Jesus. Just in all, in all contexts, all the time, I want to be like Jesus. Only by the breath, the transcendent presence of God being breathed and blown consistently over and over again into me by fellowship with the Spirit. Can that happen? All summer long, I've been reading every book I'm confined on the Holy Spirit. And there's thousands, so I haven't read many. But I've read a few. And I've deliberately read some from, that I haven't really looked at before. I, I, t- I totally, I knew, I knew about William Seymour. I don't know if you know about him, but hopefully we've got a picture of him in a minute. Uh, that's amazing. Is that William Seymour contacting us on Skype? from the world of the intermediate state. Here he is, Azusa Street, 1906. Have you you've heard of Azusa Street? So, 
William Seymour uh, was a black man, as you can see, incredibly poor, incredibly poor. His family was so poor, in fact, that he contracted all kinds of diseases which caused him to be blind in one eye. And he was black, which meant that most church meetings he wasn't allowed in because he wasn't white. And so what he would do is he would sit outside an open window, outside listening to what the teachers were saying. They wouldn't let him in, but he still knew he could learn from them. I love it. And William Seymour was a man just, who was described as one of the most humble of men. But the thing I love about William Seymour is this. He was hungry for the breath of God in his life. And what he demonstrates, I love it, what he demonstrates is that God responds to hunger. I mean, there is a clue in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, blessed are the hungry because they'll be filled. There's a clue there, but, but if we don't believe Jesus' clue, William Seymour shows us, okay, there's all kinds of things that maybe he said that I've been like, oh, really? I'm not sure I agree with that. But his hunger for God, his hunger for the breath of God in his life. I love it. Now, I'm just going to read this. This is a little bit from a biography of him. So William Seymour accepted leadership of a small group that met in a house, 214 North Bonnie Bray Street, which is in, sadly, California. But anyway, we probably heard about it because it was near the Americans. I've got a thing about Americans. Don't you? My wife's half American. Yeah, Americans. Are there any Americans here? (laughs) So William Seymour accepted. The small group began to meet in late February of 1906. Their meetings consisted of hours of prayer as they sought for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As the meetings grew, Seymour asked for the assistance of his long-standing friend, Lucy Farrow. He explained to the group that Farrow had an extraordinary ability to present the baptism of the Spirit. So money was collected to bring her. When she arrived, he announced that the group would enter into a 10-day fast until they received the divine blessing of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The group fasted and prayed throughout the weekend. On Monday, Mr. Lee called Seymour to his home to ask for the prayer of healing. Seymour anointed Lee with oil, prayed for him, and Lee was healed instantly. Then Lee asked Seymour to lay hands on him and pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Seymour laid his hands on him again, and this time Lee broke out speaking loudly in other tongues. The two rejoiced ecstatically for the rest of the day and walked together to the evening prayer meeting. And I'm just going to jump on a little bit. It says, One man at Azusa said, I would rather live six months at that time than 50 years of ordinary life. I've stopped more than once within two blocks of the place. This is the place around Azusa Street, this house where they met and prayed, and the Spirit of God was moving. So I've, I've stopped more than once within two blocks of the place and prayed for strength before I dared go on. The presence of the Lord was so real. It was said the power of God could be felt at Azusa, even outside of the building. Scores of people were seen dropping into a prostrate position in the streets before they ever reached the mission. Then many would rise, speaking in tongues without any assistance from those inside. I'm conscious that some of the language that is used can kind of, let's just not be worried about language. Hunger. Hunger for God's presence, breathed, is something God loves loves, loves to respond to. He loves to breathe his presence on his people. And particularly that bit where the person says, I'd rather live six months in a state where the imminent presence of God is just felt in my life in such a manifest way. I'd rather live six months like that than 50 years of just getting by. I love that. It reminds me of a psalm where David says something like, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than do anything else. Uh, It's better to have a day in the presence of God than thousands elsewhere. Now listen, many of you, we know one another. We, We 
you know, we live the Christian life, we do it together, we sing God do great things, love it. I just want to be honest that over this summer, I just realized that I need more of the Spirit. It got to the summer holidays and I just was like, God. so we got four kids and life's quite busy, pretty busy. And I remember, we, I, was, I was like, God, I, life is really hard. I, I just, does nobody know how hard this is? I'm finding this really, really hard. Like, I'm worn out. And I had this moment, like a hair-dry moment, where suddenly I felt, it wasn't instantly, but I began to say, God, I need this from you. I need from you strength. I need from you affirmation. I could feel myself in insecurity beginning to need other people's approval that I shouldn't be looking for. Do you get yourself in those positions sometimes? You just begin to think, oh, that person's opinion matters too much to me. I, I began to feel myself in that place. I began to feel myself, if I'm really honest, sometimes I'd see somebody and I think, I just don't want to love them. That love was, I could feel love draining out of me for other people. I was like, God, please, I don't want to get there. I want to love people with every part of myself. Please, God. And I just had this moment, I was just sat and I was praying and we, it was actually at the Natural Supernatural Festival and we were worshipping the Lord. And it's like, like the loving kindness of God, just the, the presence of God, just wow. And I guess I'm hoping that this morning, I, I'm asking God, you know, turn your hair dryer on all those others who are here and you're just like, I'm... Do you know, does anyone know how hard this is? Living my life? And God says, I know. I'm the transcendent God and I see you. I know, I know. Now let me come and breathe on you and bring you to life. So that's what we're going to give space to do now. It's been always his way, always his plan. That he would breathe on any who would say, I'm hungry, God. I need you. I need fellowship with you. So I'm just going to ask him to do that now. And uh, I just want you to just make a, make a bit of space in your heart to ask God, the Father, in his love, and because of the grace of Jesus, to breathe his life-giving presence on you. Not because of what you've done, not of how good you are, not nothing like that, because it's the grace of Jesus, but the love of God. So, Father, we ask that you would breathe Ruach. Breathe the Spirit. Please breathe your breath on us as your people. We need you. We're hungry for you.